The next thing we're going to look at is exceptions. Exceptions, like I said a couple of slides ago, are synchronous. Okay, That's the biggest difference compared to interrupts. Interrupts are not synchronous, they are asynchronous. Exceptions, on the other hand, are synchronous. Again, similar to the interrupts, the hardware calls the operating system at a pre-specified point. The operating system then identifies the cause of the exception. In this case, like a popular one is divided by zero. If the program user program has exceptional handling specified, then the OS calls the user program so that it's in the handle. So this is our Java exception will work like a, uh, I would like a, a divide by zero exception in Java. And then finally, the executor RTI so that the program can run the specified handler. If the program does not have a specified handler, then the OS has no option but to kill the program and possibly run some other program. So effects of exceptions are normally visible to the user program and cause abnormal execution flow. Okay, so the big difference from an exception, okay, why do we have exceptions? Okay, so the reason we have exceptions is if you didn't have them, then your code would have to look something like this. Every program would have an if bad, okay? So this is, there has to be an if bad, your then clause, and an else clause, okay? This is what your program would have to read as if there was no interrupts. Oh, sorry, if there were no exceptions. On the other hand, if there were exceptions, then your program can simply say try and catch. So normally I don't expect them there to be an exception. So I'm just going through this block. There's no if else condition and I'm really quick. But if something bad happened, then I can catch it and deal with it. Okay. We've already looked at system calls. I'm going to just refresh them so that you know the difference between system calls, exceptions, and interrupts. So in system calls, unlike they are more related to exceptions, but unlike the hardware calling to the OS to call into the application, it's the application that calls what's known as a trap instruction. So in this case, it's the app that calls into the OS. Okay. In the case of um, exceptions. It's the, so if you have exceptions, then what you have is you have the, um, the hardware calling into the OS, calling into the app, okay? In the case of uh, syscalls, it's the app calling into the OS, yeah. So in this case, hardware calls the operating system at a specified point. Operating system identifies the required service and parameters like opening a file or creating a file. Operating system runs the service, but unlike interrupts or exceptions, they're not necessarily always high priority. In a sense, you could, you could be running a system call and the operating system could get interrupted. So you could have interrupts running in the middle of a system call. Uh, they're much lower priority than um, the other ones, okay? And the interrupt sets a register to contain the result of a call. So this is how it's, it's like a function call, right? You need a return value, and the OS essentially uses normally registers to feed it back. Sometimes it even may copy back the data into user program, right? And the big deal is that to the user program, the syscall appears like a function call. Um, that's, you know, except that the function definition and declaration are all in the OS. Okay, so it's slightly different, it quite different compared to exceptions, right? So in this case, it's of course completely synchronous because the program is essentially blocked when handling system calls. So if a syscall takes X amount of time, then during the time window, the program is stopped and is doing nothing. Interrupts on the other hand are completely asynchronous. Exceptions are also synchronous, except that exceptions are an uncommon case where the OS calls into the program. And syscall is a well-defined point where the application calls into the OS. Finally, we're going to briefly, I just wanted to briefly introduce you to the layers in the operating system. We looked at this briefly in lecture two, 
But in this set of slides, I actually wanted to bring back the different ways you can, in which you can actually organize the code in an operating system. So normally what you have is you have your applications and windowing systems, uh, middleware, and these all run in uh, user land. And then you've got all your um, um, kernel and operating system for this all runs in kernel mode. So if you look at, um, and then there's the hardware itself, right? And you look at all this stuff here, the, the software stuff. The question is how do you organize that? And through the years, different people have had different opinions on how the software should be organized. The traditional view, and including what Linux does today, is essentially a monolithic mode where everything runs as one stage, right? So everything other than the applications are running uh, within the OS. So you've got your file system, the memory management, process management, things like scheduler. So if you wanted to change the scheduling policy, for example, you would have had to go into the operating system, dig in there. In fact, that's one of the things we're going to do. We're going to be changing. Um, the scheduler in Linux, right? You can change a real operating system and see your changes actually manifest themselves in the way the programs behave. So this is what is, is a, it's, it's widely used, right? Most systems in today's world use a monolithic system. Then you have the microkernels, right? And these are examples of Mark on which Apple's based, uh, you've got ExoKernel, which is a research prototype that came out of MIT. And these systems handle things quite differently. So what they do is they take all the monolithic stuff and then they create tiers out of it. So you get an API for which the application they interact with. You get the different services that are running. So each of the services that are running within the OS now run essentially in user land, possibly. For example, your CPU scheduling runs in user land, so your scheduling algorithm itself does not involve itself with how to get the thread running on the hardware. That is handled by the lower level. Like your, so this is where your OS, I'm going to call it a thin OS for lack of a better word, uh, but essentially there's a, there's a low level uh, interaction with the hardware layer that runs, a, that runs in kernel mode and then all the policies run in user mode. So this is a set, argues for a separation of policy and mechanism, okay? If you look at monolithic OS, there's a lot of, so for example, CPU scheduling is a good example, right? So you've got your scheduling algorithms trying to figure out which thread to actually run on the CPU at any given time based on fairness, priority, uh, other forms of latency sensitiveness. And then you've got the, once you've decided which thread to run, actually running the thread. And that is something that's not modified often. It's low level code that's possibly buggy in a lot of the cases. And so these things you want to run at the lowest level possible. But the algorithm to figure out which thread to run itself can possibly run in the user level. And that's what microkernels do. So to overall summarize uh, the first week of classes, uh, the OS is just like any other program. Um, is nothing special about it. Um, it um, has a main function, like any C program would. It gets called only once during boot, uh, and then it goes into idle loop. Like any program, it consumes resources. Um, like any program, it can have exceptions. For example, you try using a floating point instruction in the OS. It right? can't do that. Um, but it is a very strange program in some ways. Most programs enter and they run and they call other functions and they really are interactive only within themselves. They're not talking to other programs realistically. Right? Um, but the OS itself can actually be entered from different location in response to different external events. Okay, So the OS itself can have either interrupts, or it can have syscalls, or it can have exceptions, right? A lot of different ways. So there are interrupts, syscalls, um, and exceptions. And I would encourage you to go back to that slide with the figure on it to have a look at um, how the OS actually interacts with applications and hardware. It does not have a single thread of control. For example, it can have more than one application running on it and can be simultaneously um, interacted with from different 
parts. So you could have a syscall and an interrupt happening at the same time. So you could be in the middle of a syscall and then an interrupt could kick in. Right? It is typically not expected to terminate. So for example, even when we when there's no applications running, it moves into a lower power idle mode and it starts to wait for uh, return calls. So it's fast to wait for applications to want to run. And finally, it can pretty much execute any machine on the any instruction on the machine. It's just fundamentally different from user level applications uh, that are limited to a subset in, in the interest of security. That concludes the first week of classes. I hope to see you in the second week. Thank you.